Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another edition of A Handful of Hope. I'm so happy and grateful to have Rene Gabriel with us here today, the financial coach. We, he raises philanthropists, our listeners and entrepreneurs. They stress over money issues. 90% of the population has been taught nothing about handling money effectively, including CPAs and financial planners. Rene is a TEDx speaker and author of the award-winning, best-selling Wealth on Any Income. After two divorces and a business failure, he was flat broke at age 50 and started all over from scratch. After learning what was not taught from all his financial education, he began a multi-million, he became a multimillionaire in just a few years. He has helped thousands of people avoid the financial downward spiral. Vulnerable, blunt, controversial, and funny, <laughs> Rennie is the ideal guest for your program. And Rennie, I know you are the perfect guest for this program. So welcome and thank you so very much for being here with us today. Thank you, Jesse. It, it's my honor to, to be with you. Rene, I want to start with what does is, what is being wealthy mean to you and why is it important for you to be wealthy? Um, well, it has many different meanings for many people. For me, it has to do with having a level of assets that generate an income so work becomes a choice instead of a requirement. So from a financial standpoint, that would be how I would say what wealth is. And someone can be wealthy on having an income of $50,000 a year that they don't have to work for. Some people might require 500,000. But the point is, when you feel you can choose work or choose not to work, that's when I say you're wealthy. And an important part of that is having health, having good relationships, having a purpose in life. Those are also components. My primary focus is the wealth, is the dollars part of it. And the secondary focus is, okay, let's have a whole life approach as well. Mm. It's interesting because hearing you define it, it is much different than what the traditional definitions we are of what it means to have money is, which is cars, homes, oh. stuff. Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because um, the, the people that I work with want to make an impact on the planet. They want to be good stewards of the planet. They want to help other people. And those are the people that I want to be working with. As an example, I've got a friend from high school, you know, and, and at my age, that's a long time ago. But um, he had this Lamborghini and he wanted to buy this Porsche. And he asked if I would co-sign the loan for him because he couldn't get a loan on a quarter million dollar Porsche because he didn't want to sell the Lamborghini. Wow. He's the perfect example of someone who would not qualify ever to be one of my clients. Hmm. And, you know, it's an, I mean, I had to literally pull a thousand dollars out of him. He's worth millions to make a donation to my favorite charity, which is Shelter to Soldier. Um, but I mean, I took him down there to visit. He gives a thousand dollars. And it's just like, it's a joke. Um, so that it, anyway, all I'm getting at is it's not about stuff. Hmm. Uh, I'm not looking for working with the people who need to buy a jet plane or have their second Rolls Royce. Those are not people I have any interest in working with. Rene, tell us a little bit about your story. And I think that your story is protect, particularly, not that it's never not, but I think it's particularly important to hear today because as of this date of the recording, it's February 2nd, 2021. And at this time, we're right in the middle of this really interesting, what people are calling the new Occupy Wall Street movement, where you have people <laughs> putting money in on stocks like GameStop and ANC. And so there's these massive fluctuations where people are literally having these on these balance sheets, realizing or losing amounts of money. And what's interesting is in speaking in on some of the discussion boards around this, the people who are perceiving loss right now, not necessarily realizing it, but perceiving it, they're talking almost as like, it's hopeless. There's nothing else. You know, I can never get back to where I was. This seems impossible. Yet at 50 years old, you were at a point where you had hit kind of the bottom yes. and were able to turn things around in a very short time. So maybe you can speak to that a little bit. Yeah. Um, when, well, I'd had a couple divorces, I'd had a business failure. And so by the time I was age 50, uh, I, 
I was pretty much flat broke. I mean, there was a time in my life with, I think it was after my first divorce that I was ending up, oh no, it was prior to my first divorce. Uh, and I had the business failure. I was having to go around and collect soda bottles and cans to get the refund money to buy groceries for my family. So mm. the point I'm getting at is I know what it's like to be broke. I know what it's like to have to scramble for every penny. And it's, it's a feeling that's never left me. Um, my wife and I were just talking the other day about uh, security versus insecurity. And we've got about a half a million dollars sitting in various checking and savings accounts. And she said that that's just too much money to be sitting and doing nothing. And I said, yeah, but it gives me a, a feeling of security. And she goes, are you trying to tell me you're insecure? And I said, yes. And she says, Rennie, we've been married 22 years. Insecurity is not a name I would ever, not a label I would ever give you. <laughs> uh, and I realized, well, maybe I'm not insecure, but I got to tell you, having that kind of money makes me feel more secure. Mm -hmm. And so everything deals with how an individual processes their own situation. You know, people can feel, you know, they're broke and they're earning a million dollars a year. And people can feel wealthy that they're earning, you know, a hundred thousand a year or, or 75,000 a year. I mean, everyone's needs are different. Everyone's attitudes are different. And so when it comes to like, you know, the people playing the games in the stock market and, you know, using a uh, <laughs> game stop uh, to take advantage of, of the hedge funds or, you know, all getting together on Reddit and saying, let's, let's stick it to the boat folks on wall street. Um, I, I find it entertaining because none of well, for, first off, I, you know, I, I almost feel like I'm rambling, but my head's going in so many different directions. Wealthy people, and, and, I, and I do want to talk about wealthy people because it's a mindset, are not limited to stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. That's probably the most important thing that I could say because <clears throat> I, it took, um, I'm going to have to clear my throat before I talk some more. Hold on mm -hmm. a sec. When I was starting over at age 50, um, I used a principle that's 5,000 years old. And, it's, and, and probably most of the people listening to you have heard it and it's called pay yourself first. It doesn't mean they're doing it, but they've heard of it. And so what I'm talking about is at age 50, I decided this is the third time I'm treating myself like I matter and paying myself first. And it took me three years to save up $18,000. Mm -hmm. So I was not making a lot of money and I did it by buying individual stocks, but they were conservative stocks. They were the stocks listed on the Dow Jones list of 30. And when I had an opportunity with two other people, cause I say wealth creation is a team sport. I sold off that $18,000 worth of stock. And I used that as a down payment with my wife and this realtor to buy a little three unit property. I took it all and placed it in real estate. And within five years, we, or maybe it was six years or something, we sold that property for a half a million dollar profit. And we didn't have to pay taxes on it because in real estate, they have a 1031 exchange rule, which says, if you buy something like what you've sold, which is real estate, income producing real estate, you can invest it in something new and you don't have to pay the capital gains taxes. So with that, we went from a three unit to a 15 unit property. And during that six years, I could see this is working. And I literally went out and borrowed money because that's another attitude of the wealthy. You can borrow money to create wealth. And we made down payments on more apartment buildings. In eight years, I went from that first three unit we bought together to 50, five zero units we owned together. Wow. I went from broke at age 50 to a multimillionaire with a passive income that I no longer had to work anymore. Now I worked seven days a week for seven years to, to produce this result, but heck that seven years has set me up for the rest of my life. So, and I mean, the story is, I know what it's like to be broke. 
I know what can be done to turn it around. People don't need to do it by themselves. That's the worst possible way. Any business that you look at that's been successful, you look at Apple, you look at um, uh, General Electric, you look at Berkshire Hathaway, um, you look at Hewlett Packard, you look at Walt Disney. I could go on and on and on. There were two people at least at the beginning who were the foundations of the company. With Walt Disney, he was a visionary. His brother Roy was what's called an execution master. He paid attention to the money. He followed on Walt's visions. In Berkshire Hathaway, you, everybody knows Warren Buffett, but not too many people know Charlie Munger, who happens to be half of Berkshire Hathaway. He's the ex execution master. So what I'm getting at is, in my business with the real estate, I had a visionary and I was the execution master. Hmm. Um, you know, I, I followed the lead. And anyone who's listening to this needs to recognize you don't create wealth by yourself. You don't create a successful business by yourself. You don't even create health by yourself because people need an accountability partner. They need a, a, a physical trainer or whatever. Those are what really produces the results. So, okay, I, I, time to step off the soapbox. No, I love that soapbox. And if you're open to it, I'd love to dive deeper into the psychology mindset piece around what the differences and how the wealthy think versus the non-wealthy. Oh, absolutely. So um, go ahead. Oh yeah. So I just, I want to think here you are, you're 50 years old. You decide to invoke this age old principle. It's been around 5,000 years paying yourself first. It takes three years and you're able to save $18,000 doing it and largely investing in very conservative, solid businesses through the Dow 30. Correct. You have the opportunity to pull that out put it into a three unit property that ends up going up substantially over the next six years. So during this period of time, and you're in this kind of wealth accumulation mindset, and even once you start to become where you're at that point where you're wealthy and you know no longer how to work, I'm curious, what is your, what is your daily mindset in terms of tangible tasks and actions you're taking? Like were there five things or three things that you did every day without fail, no matter what that could become a, ritual or routine for someone to begin to mirror and implement into their life? Uh, there were a couple things that I did. And, and I think what you touched on is really the most important. And it has to do with a mindset and having a routine. One of the things that I did was I would jog regularly. If I mm. couldn't go jogging, I would do push-ups. Uh, I would exercise my body. Um, another thing that I would do is I would listen to tapes. I would listen to, uh, I think this was, well, I guess podcasts were around at that time, <laughs> but, <laughs> but because I recognized that it's my mind that's going to produce the results, I needed to feed my mind on a regular basis, whether it was listening to motivational tapes, whether it was talking with people who were where I was, who, where, who were where I wanted to be. Uh, there were people in, a, in an income strata that was higher than mine. I was in a mastermind group with two other people who I would label as more successful than me. Um, but I was able to support them because, you know, you, do, you don't have to be as sharp as everybody else to still benefit someone else. Um, you look at a program like Alcoholics Anonymous, where you have alcoholics who are one or two steps ahead of a new person helping that new person stay sober, which helps them say, stay sober. I mean, there are examples all around where all you have to do is be a step or two ahead of someone else and you can help them and it doesn't have to be in the same area. I love, so, I, I just, I love that distinction because I think sometimes people hesitate to even begin or to reach out because they have that, what do I have to offer or how am I gonna help that person? And we, we handy our, handicap ourselves from taking action based off of perception that they're so above or beyond where we are that we'd only be weighing them down instead of looking at how could I possibly help lift them up further. You're, you're absolutely right. With uh, the, the realtor who found this little triplex for us, he was able to find opportunities. All I did was just follow. However, 
we would sit down and have lunch and have conversations. And he would talk about things going on in his personal life where he was having struggles. And I could give him input in terms of either ways to deal with that or just be a sounding board. I didn't even necessarily have to say anything. And that was support for him. Gosh, that's so true. It, it's incredible. It, it continues to amaze me how invaluable human connection and presence is. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right? It, it, it's been tough this last year with Zoom because there is a, a different, I want to say, physiology when you're physically with someone else yeah. as opposed to on Zoom. You know, hey, it's, it's okay. It, it kind of works. <laughs> but it is not the same as being physically with someone. And, and it does make a difference. I mean, having lunch with a few people, getting to hug my grandchildren, I, those things are missing right now. When you bought, uh, one more question about the triplex running, and then I wanna shift gears. When you bought sure. the triplex, did you rent out all three of the units? Did you live in one and rent out the other two? How did you approach that? Because I've heard different strategies for different people. Yeah. Get a well, yeah, my, my wife had a house. She okay. had sold my home uh, prior to our, uh, right around the time, uh, near our marriage. The point is she sold my home and that gave me a few thousand dollars. I mean, I mortgaged, mortgaged it to the hill to pay off my second divorce. Um, and so I was living in my wife's house. So the triplex we bought, we rented out all three units. But the important part about this is we bought properties that had deferred maintenance, looked bad, and were mismanaged. Hmm. And so the seven days a week that I was working, because I couldn't, we couldn't afford to hire a lot of people to do work, I did a lot of the physical labor. Hmm. I would pull up the carpets. I would paint the walls. I'd, I'd replace the garbage disposal that wasn't working because we couldn't afford to make to hire people to do all this stuff. But we did buy, like I said, properties that were, had deferred maintenance, were mismanaged. We cleaned them up, we re-rented them, we gave them, they had higher rents because of what we did. And that's an important ingredient that a multi-unit property has over a house. The value of the property is based on the gross rental income. When you raise the rents, you multiply the new rents uh, with the factor and you have an increased value in the property. Hmm. Don't have that going on with a house. That's, that's such a powerful distinction. And Rennie, I'm curious, as you started to become wealthy and as you started to surround yourself and be around people who were, who had a, a higher degree, a higher level of wealth, what was the one thing that you learned about them that you were surprised to learn? Was there something that was kind of like, I, again, I feel like sometimes, you know, there's like this, there's this mysticism about people yeah. who are wealthy, that they have something that we don't, or they're, they're almost like they're not really can't touch them. So I'm curious what that experience is like for you. It's so funny because it was such a wake up call to me. Uh, one of the people that I met was earning 150000 150 to $200,000 a year. And as I got to know him, <clears throat> I found out this person was a real nutbag. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, the things he thinks about are almost, I would define as silly, crazy, but it had nothing to do with his ability to earn a lot of money. And it's oh. sort of like, oh my gosh, you, you don't have, it, that was my biggest aha. And it, I just found it hysterical. We became good friends. Um, uh, for for quite a while. And then he kind of turned on me. It turns out he actually had um, what a therapist defined as a borderline personality disorder, hmm. which had nothing to do with his ability to make money. It only had to do with his ability to create and maintain friendships. Um, but it just, it was the idea that Emotionally, it almost doesn't make any difference what someone is like. They can still make a lot of money. You look at the people, the Holly, some of the Hollywood elites, they are some of the nuttiest people you would ever meet, but they know how to behave in front of a camera and make a fortune. 
I love that that was what you shared. It's, it's such an important demystifying the path to wealth for some is that you have to be so smart or have everything so together or have everything so figured out to, to get there. And it's not the truth at all. It's, oh, it's, no. I mean, I, I, I say this often because people need to understand that you don't have to understand math real well to become wealthy. I failed high school math. Hmm. Um, well, actually, the teacher actually gave me a D. Uh, but the reality was I, I didn't pass one exam, but he knew how hard I was trying. I did the homework. And, and so he gave me a D. But the reality was if you don't pass one exam, you failed. I mean, I literally didn't pass one of the exams. And so it doesn't take a math genius. When it came to the money, there were things I could understand. I could understand future values, present values. I could, I could multiply, add, and divide. And, and that, you know, those add, subtract, multiply, divide, that's all it was needed to become wealthy. I appreciate you sharing that I, from one barely passing high school math student to another, I would spend, I think for one year, I spent almost every day, Monday through Friday after school for an hour with a math teacher trying to learn and understand math. And all, and I passed, but it was a mercy pass. <laughs> you know, it was a mercy pass. It was so hard for me to figure out how in the heck do letters and numbers get along and commingle with this. But I could understand addition, subtraction, division, multiplication really well. It was just when it got beyond that, I was like, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like you and I were in the same category. And yeah. I have to laugh because my son, who's a chartered financial analyst and certified financial planner, also struggled in high school math. Hmm. And now he's, he was handling portfolios for Wells Fargo's trust clients because he was a chartered financial analyst. Wow. So I guess... You know, you don't have to understand calculus or algebra, you know, to be successful in investing. Rennie, you, you become wealthy. You get to a point where you no longer have to work. It's a choice for you whether you do or not. And you start to get involved in philanthropic endeavors and start to really find joy in giving. I want to talk about some of your giving and specifically Soldier of the Shelter and just a little bit about that organization, what they do, and about what giving brings to your life. Oh. Uh, it, it's funny. It, <clears throat> the path started kind of oddly in that I was just kind of cruising along in life and I severed an Achilles tendon. And so after a couple of weeks, uh, the income isn't changing. I don't have to work, but I'm starting to go stir crazy. I would go to the buildings and maybe water the lawn or sweep the stairs or something to keep myself busy. But now I could do nothing. I couldn't even change a light bulb. And I ran across a program that taught people how to um, create joint venture relationships online. And I thought, well, you know, I have this book that I wrote years earlier. Why don't I see about selling that online, creating some joint venture partners or affiliate relationships? And I studied that. And I thought, well, why don't I teach other people how to handle money effectively, do some coaching? Excuse me, I want to clear my throat again. And I started doing that for about six months and found out, I don't really enjoy this. <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah, it's nice to help other people handle their money, money more powerfully, but eh, it's too much work. And, I, and then my wife brought, she was the, the uh, chairperson of Berkshire Hathaway's Charitable Foundation. And someone brought to her attention a charity called Shelter to Soldier, where dogs that could have been euthanized uh, are rescued if they have the right personality and size. And they're trained as service animals for the people who go to foreign lands and allow us to do what we do in the United States, our soldiers, who put their life on the line. And when they come home, if they have post-traumatic stress or traumatic brain injuries, they are not supported like the heroes they are that give us the freedoms we have. <clears throat> 
And they commit suicide at the rate of almost one an hour, 22 a day. So this charity provides service dogs for those who have traumatic brain injuries or post-traumatic stress, and they don't end up committing suicide. Not one person who's gotten their service dog has committed suicide. Uh, so this, and my wife and I always donate to different charities, but this one is saving two lives at a time. Dogs that would have been euthanized, and I think they're the greatest creatures on the earth, and people that would have committed suicide who provide the freedoms that we have. Mm. So uh, I started with a small thousand dollar donation. And then I heard one of the, uh, the soldiers who'd gotten his dog talk about what it was like before and after. He came back with a traumatic brain injury, stuttered so badly he couldn't communicate with his own family. Um, I'm sorry, I, it's difficult to look at you while I'm doing it this, we're on Zoom, but when I think about it, I have to kind of like not think about it or I just, I can't talk. Um, this service dog changed his life. It allowed him to communicate with his family. It allowed him to go to the events with his daughters, like their, their soccer games. It allowed him to go shopping with his wife. He couldn't leave the house before. And as he's telling the story so eloquently, I'm starting to bawl like a child. And so then I said, I, I've got, you know, a thousand dollar donation, what a joke. Uh, it costs $15,000 to train one of these dogs and feed them and take care of the veterinary bills and house the soldier so they can be trained with the dog. So I donated 15,000. And the feeling I had I'm getting chilled. I, I can't really describe it, but the idea that I was able to save a human being's life and a dog's life and cover all of the costs was just a joy I can't describe. Mm. And so my wife and I gave another 15,000 and another 15. So far we've given away about a hundred thousand dollars to the charity. And I decided it's uh, too much work, uh, this online business I started, but you know what? If I give away 100% of the profits, I'll have a reason to keep doing it. 100% of the profits will go to shelter to soldier. And so that's the only reason I continue doing it is to continue to raise money for the charity. And that online business is the wealth on any income, right? Wealth on any income. It's teaching other people how to handle money powerfully. It's so we can raise more philanthropists because that's what it's about. And to do that, you know, people need to create some level of wealth. They need to know that they're making enough money or saving enough money or investing enough money that they can give away more money than they thought. Randy, before I ask my final question, and I actually might, I'm just going to put a asterisk in here. I might have a final two questions. So I reserve the right to ask an extra one if, if that, need be. Where can, no, you've got the right. Yeah. Where can people find and connect with you online? Where's the best places to go? Uh, best place would be the website, wealthonanyincome.com. We have free resources. Um, they could get a roadmap to financial freedom if they uh, type... Um, wealthonanyincome.com forward slash TEDx. They'll see my TEDx talk. I talk about shelter to soldier. They can get a roadmap. I have a book called Attitudes of the Wealthy they could buy. They can get a free summary of my award-winning best-selling book. So all that's available. They just go to wealthonanyincome.com. Perfect. And I'll tell everyone too, I've watched Rennie's TED talk two or three times now and it's it's very inspiring in the sense of it. He communicates very clearly that what he's talking about and doing isn't rocket science, meaning that it's accessible <laughs> to all of us. And I, I've had a couple conversations with Randy now prior to recording, and I was sharing with him how inspired I am about him because much of my desire for acquiring wealth is to be able to do things that are and support causes that are as meaningful and do the work like organizations like Shelter to Soldier do. So 
I, I encourage you to start with any of the resources Renee just shared. Check his TED Talk out. It gives you a great overview of some simple things that you can start doing right away. And I think more than anything, it empowers you that no matter where you are in your wealth accumulation journey, you can do it, that it is possible. Renee, you mentioned while you were talking about Shelter the Soldier and how you came upon it, your wife works or had worked in Berkshire Halfway in the charitable piece of it. Is that correct? Yeah, she's a realtor. Okay. And uh, Berkshire Hathaway owns a bunch of real estate companies. And as a part of giving back to the community, they have a charitable foundation. And my wife was the chairperson of the local Berkshire Charitable Foundation um, in her real estate company. Uh, there were several offices. The agents could donate a half of a percent of their commission to the foundation and the foundation would support causes of uh, helping, you know, donate to the Children's Blind Foundation and uh, food banks and uh, drug rehabilitation and, you know, shelter to soldier and all sorts of stuff. So the culture, they had a culture already that was, that was built around giving. It was built into the company culture. That's correct. That's incredible. And that's an idea for people who are listening as business owners, people who are leaders in companies listening to this. Consider the opportunity of creating a culture of giving. You know, imagine that you heard Rene describe about the joy he felt, the goosebumps he felt. And if you're listening to the audio and you're not seeing the video, when Rene was sharing that story, he wasn't even able to make eye contact with me because he was moved so deeply by it. I hear people all the time reach out and ask me, Jesse, you know, how do I get my employees to perform better? How do I get them to, to rise to that next level? And I might suggest that one place you may look to do that is to create a culture of giving. Give them, by teaching them how to give, you may very well give them an opportunity to tap into one of the most beautiful emotional experiences there is. And that's the emotion of what it means to give and to serve at a deeper level to others. Yeah, just, I mean, you've already said it, Jesse, I'll just phrase it in a different way. But if you had a choice of doing business with two people, uh, you wanted to buy a new car and car dealership A would sell you a car and, you know, that's the end of the story. And car dealership B said, for every car we sell, we donate $100 to whatever cause. If it's the same car, which dealership would you rather buy it from? The car that you're sh it's donating, the car donating, no, no question. Exactly. Yeah. Right. It's real simple. And, you know, not everybody feels that way, but obviously those that do, that makes a big difference. Rennie, final question, and you've shared so generously with us today. I'm wondering, you've had this incredible journey, this incredible experience of going from broke to wealthy in a, in a span of time. You did the work hard. Now you don't have to work. You get to work because of choice to support these incredible charitable endeavors. We've talked about security and insecurity, and, and I'm wondering if there is one question that I haven't asked you today that if you were to leave our time together, you would think, shoot, Jesse should have asked me that question. And if there is one question that I haven't asked, what is that question? And if you wouldn't mind answering it, that would be wonderful. Um, I, I, I'm pondering several things and one of them might be, uh, what's the first step people need to take to create wealth? And it, the answer would be to treat themselves like they matter, which mm -hmm. means pay themselves first from the money that they're earning. And what that ends up doing is creating a cascade effect, a change in mindset where people start earning more money because they recognize it doesn't just flow in one direction flow in and then flow out and and they're just like a conduit for the money when they keep some of it it creates a change in attitude and they're able to earn more because it's like the universe is saying oh we see you now know how to handle it better we're going to give you more of it hmm. i love that and then for people paying themselves first would you recommend them having a separate account, have it be money that they're just pulling out of their income and they're put, putting somewhere? What is there? Yes, yeah, they way? need, what I was doing was for every single dollar that came in, 
if a client paid me $90 for a consultation, I set aside $9 in a separate account. Gotcha. Okay. Everyone, my goodness, is this going to be one you're going to rewatch and re-listen to in addition to heading over and watching Rennie's TED Talk and diving into the other resources he so generously shared. Rennie took us on an incredible journey that started at age 50, nearly flat broke, and with a few pennies to his name where he was having to scrape up bottle caps and top cans to go cash in and use to buy groceries for his family, to now being able to give over $100,000 to a charity that brings so much meaning to his life and fills him with such immense joy that he literally gets the goosebumps feeling that when he's just talking about it. And we all know that beautiful goosebumps feeling, that feeling that is just a feeling of such pure, uninhibited joy and purpose. Who would have thought that wealth could give you not? Not because you can go buy the stuff, which I love when he, when he mentioned that it's not so much about the stuff and it's not at all. And that to be wealthy doesn't mean you have to be brilliant and have it all figured out. He shared how one of the people he met early on in the journey was making maybe 150, 200,000 a year. And he found himself wondering, gosh, this guy has, you know, it's kind of a little out there. But how freeing is that to consider that it's demystifying, isn't it? that we don't have to be this or that. And to also remember as we, as we compare or consider what it means to be wealthy, we also don't have to have it all figured out and recognize too that we have it within ourselves right now, wherever we are, the potential power and ability to serve those and support those who are already wealthy. That when you're seeking out mentors and advisors, people who are further along in the game as you, don't hold yourself back from reaching out thinking that you don't have anything to bring to the table. Rennie had mentioned just how invaluable it was sometimes to just be there and be the ear for somebody who's going through something. Last but not least, start with paying yourself. Rennie laid out some excellent ideas and examples of what wealthy mindset looks like and behaviors you can do and things and tangible takeaways you can do. But if you do one thing from today, you take one immediate action today, which we hope you do, it's going to be start paying yourself. Start paying yourself and putting that value on yourself. And if you're already doing that, if you're already on the path of wealth or you're already wealthy listening to this, then the invitation might be to you is how can you give more? And if you're already giving more personally, then it might be how can you give more professionally? What does that culture of, of giving look like in your company? And as Rene was saying, if you're a car dealership and you have the choice of selling a car, and you have two choices, buy the car for the same amount, but one of the dealerships is going to donate a portion of the sale to a charity. Who are you going to buy from? And that's a great opportunity to consider what kind of business do you want to operate? Because ultimately your customers may have a choice of who they do business with. And it's just going to help enhance the customer experience as well as it'll enhance the workplace experience too. Rennie, this has been absolutely incredible. I'm so grateful we finally were able to have this conversation. Thank you so much for sharing so generously. And I look forward to many more incredible conversations to come. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. It was my honor. And your summary was fabulous. Thank you. We will see you next time, everybody, on another edition of A Handful of Hope. Bye-bye.